recording and share my screen. Uh, so power supplies, welcome to the power supply crash course. Um, we'll just jump right in. So um, our, when we're talking about power supplies, you know, we're gonna, basically we're talking about anything that's gonna convert, usually converting voltage and producing like a regulated output of some kind. It doesn't have to be voltage, it could be current. You could have a, a constant current power supply if you're driving things that, you know, I want this to always be 100 milliamps. But most of the time, we're talking about voltage. Um, we talk about like a voltage regulator or a, um, you know, something like that. That's that's a, an example of or a component of a power supply, um, if not the whole power supply. Um, but we would break our power supplies into two really broad categories of either linear power supplies or switching power supplies. And uh, we'll start by talking about linear power supplies and then move straight on into switching power supplies. Um, so how to describe a linear power supply, we would say that, I mean, in, sh in short, like you characterize it being linear um, in that it's, it has some component in it that will, um, that sort of operates in a linear fashion and that it will drop Usually it's, it's dropping voltage by varying the resistance of some pass transistor element. Um, so imagine you have some unregulated voltage out here. You'll have this pass element or pass transistor like so. Then you'll have, well, we could sort of build this, if we were building one of these, we would have some reference voltage. So without a reference voltage, without something to de to define a vo what voltage means, you know, you don't know. Your power supply can't know um, how to regulate the output. So then we would have usually like a resistive divider. There's a basic. There's a basic. Uh, linear power supply. And then this is your regulated output. And it's all going to depend, of course, on what what your reference is and what your resistive divider is. But you can let's let's pretend this is R and this is R, and this is a 2.5 volts reference. So this will end up being a five volt output, right? So suppose my, Initially, my voltage is, let's say it's 10 volts and I've got, you know, well, let's say it's nine volts. You know, if the voltage drifts up too high, right, then this goes above the reference. And this be the behavior of our amplifier is to bring its output voltage down, which starts to turn off the pass transistor and it restricts the amount of current that's flowing to the pass transistor. Then, as you know, as the voltage at the output drops below the reference or causes our feedback to drop below the reference, you'll see it um, you'll see it start to turn you know the output goes more positive, which forces more current through the pass transistor, which brings the voltage back into regulation. So you can see how that feedback loop, this is another, here's an application of negative feedback like we talked about. This is sort of the fundamental block diagram drawing of every linear power supply. Um, so some, let's run through some quick characteristics of a linear power supply. If I can spell it right, I think I spelled it right. So, they're very um, low noise. 
there's, you know, it's a very smooth and stable output. So there's low noise, um, low ripple, or if any ripple. I mean, there's effectively no ripple. And they have excellent line and load regulation. So what this means is for, a, for some variation in supply voltage, you have very small variation in output voltage. And for variations in the load, you have very small variations at the output voltage. So they're, they're really nice. They're very smooth. They're very fast. We could say they're high bandwidth. So you can, you can um, be drawing, shoot. <laughs> well, they're high, high bandwidth. So that, that all just feeds, goes back to the, the whole, them being very fast to respond to changes. It's like it's, it's, they're basically as fast as your amplifier and as fast as your pass element, um, your pass transistor. As, if those are very fast, you know, you have a high bandwidth op amp and you have a high bandwidth transistor, you can have a very fast response to any transient changes. So these all sound really good, um, but there's also some problems. So maybe you can spot the problem here. Um, if I have nine volts here and I have five volts here, you know, what's happening to that four volts? You know, first of all, we know that any current I that goes into this transistor is the same current that's going out of the transistor. So you you don't, you know, you you're drawing the same current. So if I had 10 milliamps out here, I have 10 milliamps out here. So if I have not a power in equal to nine volts times 10 milliamps, which is that right? How many watts? And if I have a power out of five watt or 50 milliwatts, right? There's some discrepancy here. I'm only getting 50 milliwatts out, but I'm getting, I've got almost 100 milliwatts going in. Where's that other power going? Well, the answer is that it's being dissipated by your pass element, your pass transistor. That's, that's really the fundamental downside of linear power supplies. Is any power, basically they're inefficient. Any, any power that is not getting used at the output is dissipated in the transistor. And so we can, in this case, this little simple diagram we built up, um, if our output is, you know, this is just under 50% efficient, right? Um, yeah, is that right? Sorry, this looks, yeah, because the, the power out, yeah. I think it's above 50% efficient. The efficiency, of course, is, you know, power out over power in. And so, call it. Um, yeah, that was like 55% efficient in this hypothetical case. Um, you know, but this is kind of like a hypothetical case that, you know, you may never, you may never actually reach. Um, but the point being, you know, the efficiency is usually worse. The efficiency is usually worse. You could imagine, let's say we had like, I don't know, 12 volts out here. Well, now I've got 120 milliwatts power going in, but the power out is the same. So I'm dissipating more power and getting worse efficiency. So you can, this is gonna get, this relationship you can imagine is just gonna get worse and worse. 
So there are really nice, there are nice characteristics of linear supplies, but there are, there are drawbacks. Um, before we move on to another, I guess I talked a little out of order. We should actually, I wanted to hammer more on the simplicity of linear power supplies by um, drawing one that doesn't use an op amp. So you may be saying that, you know, I don't want to use an op amp in my power supply. Maybe I just want to build it out of like discrete components and it's not that hard to do. So let's actually, let's actually do that for a moment. So we know that we're going to have to have some kind of pass transistor. Um, and we know that we're gonna have some kind of feedback. And when this, we also know that we're gonna have some kind of a reference somewhere. But let's say that when this is too high and this goes above some reference, we'll have an element that pulls well, by, by default, we want this thing to switch on, right? So we'll have a resistor going like that. But then as this gets too high above some reference, we need this to start drawing current away from the base of this transistor. So the way we'll do that is by putting a Zener diode as our reference. Remember Zener diodes. And then we have to bias this Zener diode into the on state. So we will do that. So you need some resistance that's going to bias this into the on state. And I believe there might be a few more resistors we need scattered around. But this is fundamentally all we need. Um, yeah, this is all we need, pretty much. And now you've got um, this is the simple a simple linear power supply. It's not a great linear power supply. If you simulate this in SPICE, you'll come up with some, you know, it's maybe 5% load regulation. Um, it's not super duper great, but it's not, but this is the simplest supply I could come up with. And uh, you can do some various things and make it simpler or not simpler, make it better. Uh, but there you go. Again, like, uh, this is has to be a fairly beefy transistor to dissipate power, but then this can be any sort of garden variety BJT, and this is just some Zener. Another thing that's maybe not great about this supply is that um, our poor Zener, well, first of all, the Zener might be taking, um, I don't know, you know, it could be taking a few hundred microamps. That's not that bad. You can definitely live with that. Um, but in low, in really low current applications, maybe you can't live with that. That's something to keep in mind. Um, and also the current through the Zener is kind of in this drawing is at the mercy of any variations at Vn. So Vn goes from 12 to 24 volts. You've sort of doubled Vn and possibly doubled, approximately doubled your Zener current, which can cause, you know, 50 or 100 millivolts of change. Um, depending on if you care about that, that could be a problem. But there you go. So we'll move swiftly forward from here on to switching power supplies. And I think it'll, it'll become obvious why they're called switching power supplies. Um, it's because they have some element that acts like a switch that will um, that sort of chops up the input and produces some lower voltage output. Not, but not always lower voltage. We don't have to produce a lower voltage. We could be producing a higher voltage. Um, we will look at that. But the, the, the reason they're called a switching power supply is they have a switch in it that or some element that instead of acting in its linear range where it's dissipating power, the pass transistor acts like a switch. Or it's not always a pass transistor. We'll see. Um, so the first one, the, the one that's most analogous to our buck or our um, linear converter is what's called a buck converter. 
Um, you can think of it as you know, it takes power and sort of or takes voltage or and bucks it, I guess. It's a step down converter. Just like our the last converter we saw, which was a step down, you know, it took a high voltage and produced a lower voltage. Um, and it is switching. But let's um let me just start drawing it. So, like I said, we're going to have some kind of a switch, some pass element that acts like a switch. Um, then we're going to we're going to well, let's draw our, our input voltage. You're going to put this into an inductor, and then you're going to have an output capacitor. And this is our V out. And then you're going to control this switch from some kind of control block that takes feedback from the output and switches that. And there's one other component we need. One, one other component we need. And I started drawing it badly, but we need a diode right there. And there is a buck converter. And of course, the control makes the SDC ground. Um, so the, the idea of a buck converter is that you will, you know, some, your, you know, theoretically, without any losses, you know, your conversion efficiency is like 100%. Of course, there's no, it's not really near that in practice, but if there were no losses, if every component in here were ideal, we would have no power loss. So the, what, what's going to happen is when this switch closes, um, sorry, when the switch closes, you get a current through the, here into the inductor through the output capacitor and returning through ground, right? And so this is going to charge the inductor to some current, let's label that this current I. So then what's going to happen is you're going to open the switch. I'm going to open the switch and this current stops in that loop, but the inductor, let's remember our rule, one of the rules of inductors is that they want to maintain the the constant a constant current through them, or in other words, the magnetic field that you built up in that inductor is going to create an induced voltage. You know, so it's going to do what we call flying back. It's going to fly back, and it's going to con so the voltage here drops low while this voltage tries to go high. You have a capacitor out here maintaining that voltage. So, but this voltage, this node here can swing around as much as you want. And so this voltage drops negative, and you're going to get current flowing in this loop now while this is open. And then in a moment later, you're going to close the switch again. And, you know, this current is going to stop. And now you're going to get current again through here, charging the capacitor. And so the voltage, you know, the, the capacitor works to kind of smooth out the voltage that's happening by absorbing these current pulses. But you can imagine the voltage at the output is going to ripple ever so slightly. Not much, but you know, it could be a lot if you didn't design it well. But if this is a appreciably large capacitor on the output, you know, you'll get a pretty small voltage ripple or something that you can tolerate, of course. Um, and the current, the current through the inductor um, is going to be, well, we can draw what it looks like. Uh, we should move to get more space. Uh, so we will replicate that drawing again.
this time we won't include our control node because it's just you have to you know that it's there but we're just drawing the power components now so let's draw a big graph draw a thing like this so our, you know that there's well actually let's draw we'll abstract it and say this pwm controls the switch. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going through this a lot because this is a, this is a really important topology to, to understand. I don't expect that after today, you guys will be like experts, but the point is, I think it's useful to, to go through this. So our PWM, let's say, is like this. And we'll say that when the PWM is high, the switch is turned on. So we'll go with that assumption. Hope I've drawn that well enough. I could space this out a little more. Yeah, I'm going to do that. PWM. Um, next, let's draw the voltage. Let's call it V switch. We'll say the polarity is like that. V switch, voltage at the switch. And let's draw another parameter, which is going to be I sub L, because L is for inductance, so it's I sub L. Now, the, the loop that the current makes could be different and different um, at different times in the in the cycle, but we're just going to look at, oh, there's one other current we should draw, which will be I in. So the, if we look at this system like this, there's some current going into the system. And well, for that matter, there's some voltage going into the system. But we've drawn our supply as a voltage source. So it's constant. We'll say it's pretty much constant. So let's first draw the, the voltage on our switch. Well, let's actually first draw the inductor uh, waveform. So when the, let's assume that, well, I've drawn the PWM like this starting low, should have started at high, but we'll, we'll just start at this point time here. So we're just gonna start looking at our inductor sometime. Um, what's going to happen with IL that when it's when our switch closes, the current is going to start ramping up. And it will be very linear like this. It will look very slopey like this because you have a voltage at the V at the output. You know, V out is pretty constant and stable because you have this capacitor out here that can absorb current. If you didn't have that capacitor, there'd be nothing to keep the voltage from, from going all over the place. But in this case, we do. So that's so remember the formula for um, if you have voltage across an inductor, it's equal to L delta I over delta T. I'll draw it like that, delta T. Um, you could derive this from more fundamental equations, but take my word for it that it's real. Um, so if we if we close the switch and suddenly across the inductor, you see your supply voltage minus the output voltage, right? So that's going to be the out minus V in. This is equal to L over the change in I over some change in T. So an L is constant, we just have an inductor L. So you, you can see that that's going to result in a, in a slope of the, it's going to res, result in a constant slope of current. Okay, so then say the switch opens. Well, let's, let's start drawing our V switch to V switch. 
let's say this is zero volts. This is the in. Uh, I'm going to draw those. And the V switch, when you're in the off cycle, it's actually below ground because it's a, it's a diode drop below ground. So the V switch, the inductor is flying back and it's freewheeling through this loop in the off state. But then, then in the on state, the switch is now closed. So it's forcing the V switch to the end. And then in the off state, it flies back again. And you have that switches on again, switches off again, and et cetera. Let's continue then with our inductor current. Um, when the switch is off, you, the inductor is trying to maintain that current. So it ramps down, but it's because it's trying to maintain it. But the ramp is different now. The ramp now is, um, you know, this node here with at the top of the switching node is like a diode drop below ground. And then the output voltage is still the output. So let's, let's call this, it's, I keep saying it's a diode drop below ground. You can then neglect the diode drop. Let's say it's at ground. So now you know you have V out across the inductor equals L delta I delta T. And it's actually, if our convention is that this is positive voltage, we actually have a negative V out. So you get a negative slope on the current. And that's congruent with what you would see. Then to complete the drawing, we the switch closes, current ramps up, current ramps down. And if we were looking at this in, at any time, you'd see this. Well, there's our inductor current. And what's happening with the input current? What's happening with the input current? Because that's an, kind of an important thing. You know, you kind of care, you know, what it looks like uh, to, to the thing that's providing power. Well, obviously, while the switch is off, you have no current. When the switch is on, suddenly, suddenly the current shoots up to some, you know, whatever this level is, then it ramps up because it's supplying all that current to the inductor. Then you open the switch and it, and it stops. Then there's none. Then you close the switch, shoots up again, starts ramping up, then it drops, and then it continues. So the, the current I in is actually being pulsed, you know, like it's being pulsed at like uh, at whatever frequency you're running this, this system at. And that, you know, you have to consider that when you're um, when you're building buck conversions. So the current, the current that's at the output, if we look at the average current, let's draw it in purple. You know, the average current, at the output is something like this. And it's, it's going through some kind of load, like so, through some load. And that's our I average. And you can see then that you know, the average current during this ramp up time is equal to I average. And it's the same, the average current in the off half cycle when the PWM is off is also I average. So you have that average current on the ramp up and the ramp down. So you know, while it might seem like you're able to get, you know, you're only putting in you know, let's say the average current here is that, then it's zero, then it's that, then it's zero. You can say, okay, the, uh, the average current from the input is much lower, or here it looks like it's about half, right? So it's maybe half of the output current, right? So it looks like you're getting something for nothing. It looks like you're getting current for, for nothing but you're not getting current for nothing. Remember that the, the energy that you put into the inductor 
during the on half cycle is then being used in the off half cycle to power the output. So you're not getting something for nothing. You're just, trans you're just using that inductor to shift around energy. So you charge up the inductor with more energy than you need in that quanta of time. Then the inductor takes that energy and dissipates it at the output in the off half cycle. So just an important distinction to make. But that, that's buck converters. Let's, this is supposed to be a crash course. So let's, let's move on to some other converters. I, I said before that you know, we don't have to only get like a step down effect. We can have a step up effect. You can get a higher voltage than you did um, at your input. So this is what we call, surprise, surprise, a boost converter. Goodness. Boost converter. So how a boost converter looks is say you have some output or input voltage. First, we're going to put it through an inductor. Then we're going to have a switch. Then you're going to have a diode. Then you're going to have a capacitor. There's your V out. So you're like, well, what's that going to do? I mean, this doesn't make any sense. Because, you know, but what's going to happen is I'm going to, when I close the switch, current is going to flow through here. It's going to magnetize the inductor to some current. Then I'm going to open the switch. Then I'm going to open the switch. The inductor wants to maintain that current. It wants to continue pushing that much current. So it's going to complete a loop like this. Um, you know, loop like this. And it's going to then charge the, the output capacitor to some voltage. Um, to what voltage, you may ask? Well, um, it's going to depend on the load, the load, you know, how much current you're drawing from the load and the duty cycle of your on of your um, of your converter. Oh goodness, why did my switch go away? Hey Adam. Yeah. I'm wondering why you need the capacitor in this circuit. Yeah, like if you didn't have this capacitor, what's gonna happen is when I've switched this off and there's no current, or sorry, when I've switched it back on rather. They close this again, then the load, now there's nothing supplying. If I didn't have the capacitor there, there's nothing to continue supplying current to my load. Does that make sense? Yeah, because the capacitor stores. The capacitor right stores. Yeah. So right. it continues to supply. Exactly. So if you didn't have that capacitor, you would just be, you, you know, you'd have your load being powered, then you would open it and you, there'd be no power to the load because there's nothing supplying current to it. So the, the, that's a really important thing that you brought up. It's that the capacitor has two jobs. One is to absorb the energy, you know, during the sort of on cycle, but it's also during the off half cycle, it has to supply energy to the load. So that if your load suddenly draws power, during the off half cycle, there's nothing your power supply can do until the next on half cycle. Um, so yeah, that's an important important thing to keep in mind. But yeah, that's a boost converter. Um, I could, I mean, we can kind of go into all the, the same sort of analysis, but I think you can see how it's sort of analogous um, it's sort of analogous to the buck converter, except that, say, this is my PWM here. And say my inductor current, my inductor current now, well, it still ramps up. It still ramps up when the switch is closed and down when the switch is off. It still does that. Um, 
but now the, the significant thing is the current um, through, well, through this loop, we could call this maybe I diode, because it's the current through the diode. Yeah, I diode. So I diode is only there when the induct, when in the off half cycle. So, and it's always a downward slope. Like so, and of course, this being, sorry, don't change the colors. So that's that's what that the you know the current through the diode looks like. So you can see there that um, you've got some potentially really high. I mean, you got this, this big spike here. Where the current is going from, you know, zero through the diode to lots, but it is worth noting that the input, the input current is much smoother. Like if we draw this I in, well, the I in is really smooth now. It's kind of like, well, not like that. It's all pretty smooth. The output current is smooth too because of the capacitor, of course. The, the output current, let's draw some kind of load here. Then you've got this. And you can, um, you know, because of the capacitor, you're getting you're getting um, the effect of smoothing out the voltage um, by absorbing current that's not being used by the load. Because um, say I say my average current here is one amp. I don't know, one amp. Um, or say my load. Uh, let me instead say that my load requires one amp. Um, if my load requires one amp, then I know that I have to supply an average of, well, I have to supply one amp during the off half cycle. Um, so that means um, how does this mean in the waveform? I mean, what I'm gonna, what I'm trying to get at is that, you know, this voltage, which you're hoping is going to be higher than the input voltage. Well, it will be if you design it correctly. Um, say this is 10 volts for five volts in, and I have one amp being pulled at the output. In an ideal situation, in an ideal situation, I can, I can do with two amps average going in. Because you know, I need to be able to supply one amp during the off half cycle without discharging my capacitor all that much. So how much current do I need during the on half cycle? And the answer there, the answer, not as of, I didn't prepare to talk about. Well, let's let's leave this one for an as an exercise for another day. Um, you know, but the num everything is here and knowable for us to figure out. Um, there's no mysteries, but there is at the moment for me. Um, so, lastly, I wanted to talk about some ice um, some isolated topologies. Um, and you won't, you won't often, like in robotics, for example, we don't, we don't often care about these kinds of topologies. You know, often it's like, you know, you know, whatever. Um, we don't, we often want 
our ground, like the ground of the input to be common with the ground of the output. You know, if you just had a battery powering motors and an Arduino, you know, you want that ground to be common between all these things. But for example, this is more of an example of when you have like an offline power supply. Whatever, offline. So that means it's powered from like mains voltage. So 120 volts AC. I just thought this is an important one to bring up because they're so ubiquitous and they can be made remarkably simple depending, depending on, um, well, I mean, just open one and look at it and you'll see how simple it is. And really it depends like on how good you want it to be. Usually the more, components you have, the better you can make it, but then that increases cost and, and all these things. AC. So let's just go through the, how they do it, basically. Well, there's one way to do it, which is the old fashioned way, uh, which is the first thing you have. Here's my 120 volts AC in, in, I'm going to first put it through a big, big old transformer. Then I'm going to put it through a bridge rectifier. If you're not familiar with a bridge rectifier, what it, what it does is it takes your alternating current and guarantees that you'll always have um, a non, you know, you'll, you're guaranteeing that there's always a positive voltage between here and here. So it's, it's most often used for rectifying, for taking an AC voltage and supply and turning it into this ripply looking DC voltage. And what I mean is ripply is that, you know, if you have an input voltage like, not like that. If you have an input voltage like this, the bridge rectifier turns it into voltage like this. That's the behavior of the bridge rectifier. And so then on the output of the bridge rectifier, you have large capacitors, probably several, hopefully. Then you'll often have your linear regulator to produce your V out. So this is the old school way to do it. And it, it does the job, you know, it gets you isolation between the input and the output. So it's, you know, safer than just um, using like a buck converter straight off mains. That's not a recommended approach. This is, this is okay because um, it is isolated due to the transformer. What are some downsides to this? Why is it that you won't find this circuit in a wall adapter or your phone charger or almost anything unless it's a, they do do this still in like high-end linear power supplies where you need really smooth uh, voltage. They will do this. But you really scenario, don't see it. What's Sorry. the question? Uh, for this like scenario, what's the purpose of the linear regulator? Because wouldn't the capacitors just filter out like the dips? Oh yeah, they would. They definitely would. The purpose of this is just to get a, a better, you know, you, you don't know what voltage this, let's say this is 12 volts AC, mm -hmm. um, but this is when you rectify it and smooth it out, this is going to be 17 volts DC. And now I want to get it to be some other voltage. That's all. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this, this is fine. If you want 17 volts, then you've got it. Or, or if your transformer winding was tuned so that it could produce the correct voltage so that your output would be what you want it to be, then this is fine. Sure. Cool. That's the only reason. Yeah. Uh, so the reason we don't see these um, in application anymore is because the uh, main transformer needs to be huge. 
because remember the action of a transformer is that it transfers power between the the input and the output through magnetic flux in the core. And so if you have 60 hertz, you know, every half cycle is it takes a lot of time on the scale of transformers, it's a lot of time. So usually your transformer needs to be pretty big or you have to be somehow, you know, limiting the amount of magnetic flux that gets through the core, which also means you're limiting the uh, amount of power you can transfer. Um, transformer typically needs to be huge. But that's not always the case. You can build a, a mains transformer that's fairly small. I mean, you can make them pretty small, but not as small as a switch mode transformer. Um, let's say, let's change this. Let's change that from huge to big. We'll still write it in all caps. It's still big. And the other downside really is that um, aside from, you know, cost of the transformer and size and weight and all these things is that this, the primary is always drawing a little bit of current. Even if you're not drawing any current on the secondary, there is some current, some current being drawn, more current than you'd like. You'd like it to be microamps, but it's not. It's more like milliamps and, um, you know, can become significant, especially when it's, you know, you're putting in 120 volts AC. Um, especially when it's 120 volts AC, one milliamp, it all adds up if you have lots of devices. Uh, what, how, what, how am I trying to say this? A small current drawn on primary. So, so this, this strategy where you start with a transformer, and then do all your regulation, this kind of went away, I don't know, maybe the 80s or 90s, I think. So now there's a new way to, there's a new way to do it. So we'll start with our AC in. We'll first put it through bridge rectifier. Still have a bridge rectifier. Now the first thing it sees is a bridge rectifier. Bridge rectifier. This will form my output voltage rail. Smoothing capacitor. Then I'm going to have, you know, transformer with some kind of, I'll draw it just as a switch. Switch. Here's some control block powering the switch. It's going to be powered, oddly enough, it will be powered off the, well, not always. It won't always be powered off the, the high voltage rail, but sometimes it will be. Then you have your transformer and at the output here, you'll typically, you can get away with as little as that. There's your V out. So what are the, what are the benefits here? Well, the, the main benefit is that you can, you can switch your, you can be switching this uh, switching element at any frequency you want within some reason. Um, so you can make this transformer much smaller. Your transformer can be much smaller. Um, you know, so small that you can fit them in little tiny Apple, you know, USB plug packs. They're very small, uh, which is great because it reduces cost, it reduces weight, and the quiescent current draw can be very small. I mean, when it's not drawing current of the output, the quiescent draw can be, you know, tens of microamps, if not less. Uh, so this is good. This is good. So we can, what time is it? Well, it's about five. I think we got to wrap it up. So, but this is, this is the topology. I've left out some components, you know, I've left out the feedback from the output to input, and I've left out any sort of auxiliary windings that you might have, because sometimes there'll be like, you know, the transformer will be really big, 
and it'll have a little winding here and you'll use this to power the, the control chip, something like this. Um, that's just a side note, you know, so the auxiliary winding can actually sometimes, if you're really careful, you can use it to determine the current on the output uh, because it's going to be a direct function of how much magnetic flux is through the core. So you can use that to actually sense the current on the output. The auxiliary winding is a, is a multifunction uh, winding. But yeah, yeah, that's where we'll stop for today. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. This is fun. Um, and I will stop recording. Share.